Hello and welcome to Vegas Odds Football. I am your host, Daniel Ocho. We begin, as always, with a brief recap of our last week. And, oh, it was brutal. It's been brutal. And there's no other way to put it. The last couple weeks betting uh, our picks on this show have been tough. Uh, the teasers have just been killing me. And, and I'm not alone. I've, I've seen this in a couple of forums, a couple of Reddit pages. People all over who are betting on these NFL games, who are teasing these NFL games, are getting their shit kicked in. So for me, this week, I'm going to actually have a different sort of strategy. I'm not going to give out a big teaser of the week. Usually I do. Usually it's sort of one of my main plays here. But this week, I'm going to play it a little more safe. I'm going to try just some straight up plays. As we go through the slate, I'll sort of walk you through what I'm thinking about in terms of plays. But I'm going to try not to get too crazy this week because looking preliminarily at this week seven NFL slate, it's just not very good, especially as compared to what we just did this past week. Week six of the NFL was extremely exciting. We had two incredibly great marquee matchups. Chiefs and the Bills really sort of delivered. It wasn't the high scoring affair we maybe thought it would be, but it was very entertaining. It was really fun to see two teams that are operating at such a high level just showcase the talent that they have on those rosters. Uh, By contrast, the Sunday night game between the Cowboys and the Eagles didn't quite deliver uh, the way that I thought it might. Last week's coverage, King didn't cover, (laughs) shockingly, and which I think may be the case this week as well. The Dan Quinn and the Cowboys defense struggled to contain Jalen Hurts. The Eagles sort of easily rolled through that game. Listen, the Cowboys have been dealing with a second-string quarterback all year, Cooper Rush, who's excelled throughout the season. But ultimately, when you get to nut-crunching time, when you're playing in those divisional matchups in prime time and you have a backup quarterback, it often is one of those situations where these guys turn into a pumpkin under the bright lights. And that's what it seemed to happen with Cooper Rush. He seemed overwhelmed. He seemed really just unable to step up to the moment, especially in the first half. He, he, feel, he felt a little more comfortable or seemed to feel a little more comfortable in that second half, but in the first half, the guy just looked lost and we saw that the Cowboys could not really muster enough offense to keep up with an Eagles team that is just loaded, loaded on the offensive side of the ball. Looking ahead to our week seven slate, let's get started. First off, we begin with Thursday Night Football. Once again, the Saints are heading to Arizona. The Cardinals are one and a half point favorite here. The over-under in this game is set at 45. You've heard me say this multiple times now. I don't like to bet these Thursday night football games because weird stuff happens. I don't know what to make of the teams. I don't know how to deal with some of these weird rosters, especially on a short week. Look at a team like the Cardinals. Prime example. Hollywood Brown gets hurt. We don't know what to make their receiving core. They trade for Robbie Anderson on Monday morning from the Panthers. Robbie Anderson freshly kicked off his, his former team, the Panthers. We don't know whether DeAndre Hopkins will be able to get back on this roster despite coming off the P, uh, his suspension this week purely because it's a short week having only three days to get onto the field again a lot of times teams struggle to get their guys ready on, on a short turnaround especially guys who are dinged up a little bit with Hopkins coming off an extended suspension I'd be shocked to see him out there this week to add to that we have a Saints team that has a million injuries here no Michael Thomas no Marcus Lattimore no Jameis Winston Dalton got a back injury Chris Olave seems to be coming back from injury here the Cincinnati Bengals really kept the Saints offense in check but at this point it just feels like the Saints offense is Taysom Hill and friends. Kamara has shown up the last couple weeks in terms of actually making some electric plays with the ball in his hands, but it doesn't feel like the Saints have enough guys on their roster right now to consistently compete. The Cardinals team looked pathetic, pathetic in a divisional matchup where they were playing a defense that's been one of the worst in the NFL this year. They could get nothing going on the ground. They were giving Eno Benjamin the ball over and over and over again. He played 87% of snaps last week. Despite that, he only averaged like two and a half yards per carry. If that, maybe I'm giving him a little bit too much credit there. Nonetheless, if I'm going to take a play in this game, it's going to be Eno Benjamin props. Like I said before, I think that Eno Benjamin is in a perfect position to maximize on opportunity. He played 87% of his snaps last week uh, without James Conner there, without Daryl Henderson, both of whom are likely to miss this game as well due to injury. People are going to be fading Eno Benjamin in this spot, but I'm always chasing volume with these volume stats, like player props on players. If a guy's going to be on the field, if he's going to get carries if he's going to get targets. I want to bet on him. And Eno Benjamin is getting both right now. Give me Eno Benjamin over receptions this week. I don't know what the number's at yet because it hasn't been released yet, but assuming that Connor's out, give me his over receptions, maybe to score an anytime touchdown. Both could be a good play this Thursday night. Next up, the New York Giants, the Five and one New York Giants. It sounds weird to even say out loud. Head to Jacksonville. The Jags are three point favorites. The Jags coming off a, another big time loss, I guess, a heartbreaking loss to the Colts. Uh, a game that came down to the wire. Uh, they, they had this game in tow. It's really sort of brutal. One of those tough losses where you see these teams that are coming on and sort of people are pegging them as maybe a divisional favorite, maybe the best roster in the league. But a lot of times we see those teams sort of falter under the lights. The general principle of this past week of the NFL was parity, parity, parity. All 
these teams we thought were bad were kicking the shit out of teams that were projected to beat them. Jaguars were no different here. The, the Colts and the Jaguars, both of whom have looked like the worst team we've ever seen this year and also have shown flashes. If we take a thousand foot view here, the Colts are a team that's going to be there at the end of the season. We see them struggle to start the season every single year. We see this head coach get a lot of flack to begin the year, but if you actually step back and think about what the Colts have done over the past few years in terms of replacing their quarterback every year, having to really integrate a new guy into that system, we always see the same thing with them. They catch on as the season progresses. As the weather gets colder, you do not want to play this Colts team, and I'm not surprised to see it happening here again. The Jaguars seem to have maybe turned a corner offensively. They didn't look quite as inept as they did the, the last couple weeks. I think this is a perfect spot to fade the Giants. Everyone is eating all of this Giants hype. I live in New York everyone's oh my god the New York Giants I say it every week this is not a good team they're overachieving they're incredibly well coached the roster is not what you want it to be I don't think they're throwing to some real nobodies out there at receiver I think that this is the week they really come back down to earth they lose to Trevor Lawrence who may be putting it together offensively I know that's something I've said multiple times now I I hope that he actually does it but give me the Jaguars here minus three hop on this line early because I wouldn't be shocked to see this line climb this week this is going to be one of my bigger plays of the week I'm so keen to fade the Giants, especially after a huge comeback victory against the Ravens. The Jaguars seem primed to, coming off a loss at home, take care of business versus a Giants team that maybe is uh, sowing its oats a little bit here. Next up, the Buccaneers at the Carolina Panthers. The Bucs are 10.5 point favorites. The over-under in this game is set at 40.5. My question seeing this line is, number one, does anyone watch the Bucs play? I didn't really talk about this Bucs team ahead of last week's game against my Steelers because I thought they were going to kick the shit out of the Steelers, and Frankly, the Steelers should have won this game by three scores last week. Uh, Kenny Pickett doesn't get hurt. This game should be a three-score game. Obviously, Mitchell Trubisky had to come in and sort of clean things up at the end of the game. He he did an admirable admirable job in terms of converting third down, th- third and longs. But looking at what this Bucks team has done offensively this year, they're struggling. They're struggling to finish drives. Tom Brady, all the energy around this Bucks team, I've been saying it all year since the offseason, is super weird. When you have a guy who retires, unretires, comes back, doesn't show up for training camp for most of training camp, now. We we look at last weekend. He's at a wedding on Friday night. He's skipping walkthrough. This guy's checked out. You, you're either all the way in or you're all the way out when it comes to the NFL. This is not a, a part-time job. And not to say that Tom Brady's treating it as such, but the guy clearly has a lot of things going on, things that normal 45-year-old men have going on. It's why most 45-year-old men don't play in the NFL. And now we're sort of seeing that take hold here. This is a team that lost its head coach. Defensively, they're not what they were a few years ago. They're still really good, obviously. But Kenny Pickett was moving the ball with ease on this team. And might I remind you, that Matt Canada is still calling plays for the Steelers. They, they suck. They shouldn't move the ball with ease against anybody. I, I hesitate to take the Bucks in this spot, mainly because I think people are just eager to bet against this Panthers team. I wouldn't be surprised to see the Panthers give their third-string quarterback a, a shot here and, and bench last week's starter just because they didn't really do much offensively. It, it was gross. It was disgusting to watch on offense. They have a coach who's gone now. Matt Rule's recently been fired. He still had a job uh, last time these teams played. If you look at what this Bucks team did last week defensively, against the Rams offense that obviously isn't super great at least what we've seen this year, they're struggling with a lot of cohesiveness on that offensive line. They're struggling with explosiveness from their playmakers on the outside. The Panthers hung around that game. Uh, They couldn't really muster much of anything offensively outside of getting Christian McCaffrey the ball. But I think they will be able to move the ball somewhat in this game against the Bucs. More importantly, I think this Panthers defense is going to be a bit of a pain in the ass for Brady. I think that the Bucs are once again going to struggle to consistently sustain drive, to, to finish drives and put the ball in the end zone. Tom Brady threw like 40 touchdowns last year. He's not going to even get close to that this year. We're looking at a guy who's going to throw maybe 24, 23 touchdowns. This is not the same offense from the last couple years. Brady looks done. Looks like maybe he shouldn't have come back. Even a Panthers team that I think is basically dead in the water that is going to be probably giving their third string quarterback a shot. Or Darnold may have a shot at coming back. I don't know what his injury status is ahead of next week. But I think anyone uh, whoever plays quarterback for this Panthers team could keep this game interesting. I'm not going to throw a lot on it, but I might tease the Panthers up to 16 and a half just to, to have something in play here. I'm fading the this Bucks team in a low over under total game like 40 and a half. 16 and a half seems like a lot of points to me. So give me the Panthers here plus 10 and a half. Next up, the Green Bay Packers versus the Washington Commanders. They head to Washington. Packers coming off two terrible, terrible, no good losses to both New York teams, the New York football giants, and then last week, the New York Jets. They choke, choke, choke this game away. I don't know what's wrong with the Packers. I mean, I do. Aaron Rodgers looks completely checked out. This guy is so weird. 
weird and, and just negative. I, I, I would hate to work with him, so I can only feel so bad for everyone in that building right now. I get it. They all like him, blah, 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 blah. But it's not just Rodgers. He has a lot of young receivers who he obviously doesn't trust. He also lost Randall Cobb last week to a bad ankle injury. Now that defense, one of the highest paid defensive units in the entire NFL, has just been incredibly disappointing. There's, there's no other way to shake it here. The Packers are not a Super Bowl contender at this point in time. They're not the team that people thought they were going to be. I was never super high on this Packers team. I thought that Rodgers would likely feel the impact of Devontae Adams leaving, mainly because he's shown an inability to trust anyone over the last, I don't know, 38 years of his life. So he, he doesn't trust people until, I don't know, they, they suffer for six years or something. He didn't like Devontae Adams for the first three years of his career. So now we're seeing that come to fruition. Things are not going well for the Packers. I'm all out on the vibes of this team. A lot of pouting from Rodgers. I cannot possibly take them in this Vegas zone, even with a commander team that I don't even know who's going to be playing quarterback next week. Taylor Heineke will, in all likelihood, take the start in place of Carson Wentz, who just got or may be placed on the IR for that broken finger. Either way, I'm going to take the commanders here. I think that the Packers are just not good, and, and the commanders are in a good spot to cover here at home. Next up, Lions at the Dallas Cowboys. Over-under in this game set at 48. The Cowboys get back Dak Prescott. They are seven-point favorites here. Lions coming off a bye. Lions are, they had a lot of rest ahead of this game, obviously. Dak in his first start back from a thumb injury or a finger injury. I've said that Dan Campbell is a guy I like to bet on here. I, I've said that he's one of the funnest coaches to bet on because his teams never quit. And to me, looking at this line, I saw what Russell Wilson did last year when he came back from his finger injury. And I saw what Drew Brees did a few years ago when he came back from his finger injury. These guys struggle very often. These quarterbacks, when they first come back from these hand, finger, thumb injuries, they struggle to hold the ball. They struggle to consistently convert high leverage situations, third downs. Give me the Lions in this spot on the road against the Cowboys plus seven. It feels like such a such a game that the Cowboys blow. This Cowboys defense really sort of let people down last week. I still am very high on them. I just think with two weeks of rest and the Lions coming out of a bye, they're in a perfect spot to upset the Cowboys. Maybe even money line. I, I may think about taking that here on the road. We've seen so many dogs cover here. We've seen so much parity. I wouldn't be shocked to see the Lions win this game outright this week. So give me the Lions plus seven on the road. Maybe buy that half point to seven and a half. Next up, Cleveland at Baltimore. Divisional matchup. Ugh. I don't like to bet these divisional matchups in the AFC North. These teams beat the crap out of each other. They're always doing crazy, crazy stuff, losing, winning, crazy ways. It happens constantly. And the AFC North especially. We see injuries. We see quarterbacks knocked out of games. We see just a lot of insanity among these teams. And I think it'll be no different this week. We'll see the Cleveland Browns heading with Jacoby, Beef Brissett, to Baltimore coming off one of the worst losses of Lamar Jackson's career. The guy just completely fell apart in the fourth quarter. He was missing throws. He fumbles away the game. He throws a pick to really clinch things. I don't know what was going on with Lamar Jackson last week. I'm a big Lamar Jackson truther, but he just did not come to play in that fourth quarter. It was really sort of shocking to see. Maybe this Giants defense, that pass rush is for real, but for now, I'm just having trouble trusting the Ravens in any spot. They're six and a half point favorites here at home. I, I get why you might want to take them, why that might be the, the early indication here, but at the same time, you're not going to feel good about it. Not not based on what we've seen. That being said, the Cleveland defense is horrible. Every year I hear about how the, the Cleveland Browns have invested so much on their defense. They bring in Clowney. They have Miles Garrett. They, they're going to be one of the best defensive units in the, in the, the league, that roster. Okay then when it actually comes time to play football on the field, we see a Browns defense that is piss poor. The last two years, it's been an abomination what they've been doing on the defensive side of the ball. And all anyone wants to talk about is the roster building, the roster construction, how well they've done in bringing in guys who can contribute. At what point do, does the Browns coaching staff look in the mirror and say, wow, we're really not getting the results we're paying for on the defensive side of the ball? For as much as I'm, I'm not keen to take the Ravens here, I probably would if I had a lean on the line here. I'm probably going to avoid taking the, the six and a half line either way just because I don't trust this Ravens team at this point and this Browns defense is really bad. I do, however, like the over in this game. 46 points. The Browns offense has shown a lot to me. They're really good at converting opportunities. Beef Brissett is playing incredible. He makes plays every week with his legs. On third down, the guy is just playing out of his mind. I know they have Deshaun Watson coming back, but Jacoby Beef Brissett is going to play in this league for some time because he's a high-end backup who's going to really just help teams, I think, for the rest of his career, either uh, mentoring younger guys or delivering the odd spot start where he's needed. Before we get into our next matchup, let's briefly talk about our cover king of the week. All right, our cover king this week is Arthur Smith. 
Okay, I know. Arthur Smith, he does a lot of weird shit. He does a lot of weird personnel shit. He, he makes his franchise, generational talent, tight end, Kyle Pitts, block on the line constantly. He doesn't seem to get the, guy, the right guys the ball very often. He uses a career kick returner as a running back and turns him into some sort of stud. But at this point, two years or a year and a half into the Arthur Smith era of the Atlanta Falcons, I think he may be too good of a coach. All the guy does is win. And more importantly for us, all he does is cover. The Falcons this year are 6-0 and against the spread. They're 3-3. and their record three and three, six and zero oh against the spread because Arthur Smith coaches these guys hard. He is getting it done in weird, bizarre ways with guys who I I didn't even know could perform the way that they're performing. Cordero Patterson was a legitimate stud running back before he got injured. Marcus Mariota is a guy I have loved to bet against in the past because all he does is airmail throws. They're winning games where this guy's throwing the ball thirteen times in a game. He's throwing for one hundred and fifty, one hundred and seventy yards in a game, and they are winning in this NFL. What are Arthur Smith is doing offensively coaching is incredible these offenses are not blowing you away but they are getting the job done they're controlling the ball and they're winning games even when they're not winning they're consistently staying in games think about two weeks ago when they played that Bucks team the Bucks team was kicking the shit out of them and they still almost came back from three scores down to win that game and ultimately covered in the fourth quarter they should have had a second shot if not for that terrible quarterback roughing call that we saw that was all over the news in the past week so Arthur Smith is this week's coverage king that brings us to our Falcons Cincinnati matchup the Falcons are headed to Cincinnati uh, Cincinnati is a six point favorite the over under in this game is set at 47 and a half. Okay, so I, I know I just pumped up Arthur Smith. I know I just pumped up this Falcons team at 6-0 and against the spread, but I like Cincinnati here. The line smells fishy to me. We just saw the Falcons beat a Niners team that everyone thought was way better than them. Why is Cincinnati all of a sudden a six-point favorite? Cincinnati played terrible against the Saints last week. They Their defense played decent, I guess, in the second half, uh, not allowing Andy Dalton and that electric, quote-unquote, Saints offense to, to score. But this Cincinnati team is very inconsistent to me. They're, they're not very good at, at anything, I guess. I, I don't know what they're supposed to be super good at. And somehow the, the odds makers have them as a six-point favorite against a Falcons team that's been nothing but frisky for like two years now. I'm, I'm fading the coverage king. I'm fading Arthur Smith. I'm not going to bet on it because I'm I, I know that if I bet against my favorite guy, my, my coverage king, I will beat myself up for a week. But if I have a lean here, I think Cincinnati is going to cover that six-point line. This brings us into the afternoon slate. The New York Jets head to Denver, fresh off maybe the biggest Jets win in like five years, six years, maybe eight years. I don't know. The Jets have just been losing consistently for nearly a decade now. Finally, they go to Lambeau Field. They have all these young studs. Brees Hall, Sauce Gardner on both sides of the ball. Their, their draft is really looking like it's paying dividends. Zach Wilson still can't hit the broad side of a barn at quarterback, but it doesn't matter if you have a stud running back and a stud defense. If you have all these guys on both sides of the ball who can just control the game, you don't need to rely on your quarterback who is airmailing throws left and right and who can consistently be relied upon to make one idiotic decision per game. So it doesn't matter. They head to a Broncos team as of the time of this recording. Uh, the Broncos have not finished their game against the Chargers on Monday Night Football. Assuming that the Broncos remain one of the most putrid offenses to watch in the NFL, I I'm going to likely take the Jets here on the road. What I'm scared about in projecting this game and prognosticating about this game is that this Broncos team looks terrible again. This offense looks terrible again. And now they, they head back home against the Jets team that's riding high, coming from or coming off a major emotional victory, head into Denver, and now they get their shit kicked in. Because that seems like a real possibility to me here. I think I may be talking myself out of my Jets pick uh, just because I don't want to bet on the Broncos here. And I think a lot of people are not going to want to bet on the Broncos here. So why is this line at three and a half? Vegas sometimes is too goddamn smart. And, and I think that look Looking at this line, looking at the 43 over under, this feels like a teaser zone game. If I was going to bet the Jets, I'd maybe tease it, but more likely I'm going to stay away. I think in all likelihood, the best play here is the Broncos minus three and a half, but it feels, it doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel good to bet on Russell Wilson right now. Next up, the Houston Texans head to Las Vegas to play the Raiders. 45 and a half over under. The Raiders are seven point favorites. Why are the Raiders seven point favorites to anybody? Has anyone watched this team this year? I understand that the Texans have been disappointing. That They just fired their pastor slash football guy slash culty weirdo guy Jack Easterby and now they're still in the midst of this four year long rebuild they have Lovey Smith as head coach this team has been frisky this team has been frisky they had a bye last week Pierce is coming on at running back he looks like a real stud for them Davis Mills has been a bit disappointing but 
to me, he still looked like a competent game manager in the NFL. He's going to play in this league for a long time, whether that be as a starter or at more likely as a high end backup. He's shown enough that I think that he's going to last. He's going to he's going to last for some time. And to me, now the Raiders have shown enough after a bye week to beat up a Texans team that's been nothing but frisky. Fishy line. Another fishy line to me. Give me the Texans here, plus seven on the road. Maybe the Raiders figured it all out in their time off last week. More likely than not, this Raiders team just feels like a team that plays close games. It feels like a Josh McDaniels-led offense that can't get out of its own way sometimes, uh, and more importantly, a defense that will make some high leverage plays, will make some flashy plays, but more often than not, teams are going to rack up yardage against them. The Texans are going to be able to move the ball here, and this game in all likelihood is going to be a bit back and forth. I could see the Raiders pulling away in this game late, but the play to me seems like Texans plus seven. Next up, the Seahawks head to Los Angeles against the Chargers. 53 over under, highest of the week. Chargers minus seven. A lot of these seven-point lines lines this week, sort of weird. Now, the Seahawks are coming off a major victory. The Seahawks have, have just cashed checks for us this year. They've been a great team to bet on. Geno Smith is incredibly fun to watch outside of just being a super efficient passer this year. And now they come off a major win against a Cardinals team that looks completely lost. Their defense seemed to be putting it together a little bit. Another spot here where I want to take the underdog. The Chargers haven't obviously played their game against the Broncos at the time of this recording, but the Chargers coaching staff is so untrustworthy. They they just consistently make strange plays and high leverage game management moments. Beyond that, offensively, their offense is just so tight. It seems like they're confining uh, Justin Herbert to this strange, strange offense that I just can't understand why they would want to do this, where all his plays seem to be sort of within the the hash marks of the field. They don't really spread the ball out. Very, very strange offensive game planning. And more importantly, the Chargers defense sucks. They cannot stop anyone who's running the ball for two years now. Their head coach is a defensive-minded head coach who can't coach defense. And the Chargers are just unbelievably frustrating to anyone who was excited for what Justin Herbert and Staley as a potential head coach and quarterback duo could do to the league. We're two years in, it's not working. I want to fade the Chargers at every opportunity until Staley gets fired at the end of the year and maybe Sean Payton comes to town. Give me the Seahawks here, plus seven. I'm, I'm rolling with Geno. He's a, a future coverage king, this guy. I, I believe in Geno, and, and I want to bet on him at every opportunity. Chiefs at the 49ers. Chiefs are three-point favorites. The over-under in this game is set at 48. Chiefs coming off a major, major, major game against the Bills. They lose a tough game where Mahomes throws a pick near the end, back and forth all game. The Chiefs' offense seemed to really start clicking in this game, strangely. Juju Smith-Schuster finally shows up, explodes in a way that anyone who's been following Juju's career was really excited to see because he looked like he had maybe lost a step. The guy looks tremendous if you watch him on the field. He looks like he's 260 pounds. So it was exciting to see him really show out again. The Niners come off a bad, bad loss to the Falcons, a team that everyone thought was worse than them. The, the Niners were big favorites in that game. Everyone's selling the Niners here, despite the fact that they were at home, despite the fact that the Chiefs are coming off a major emotional game against a conference rival. Give me the Niners here, plus three. This is going to be a close, fun game, and, and I think maybe the highlight of that late slate. This brings us to our late night game, Sunday night football, the Steelers at Miami. Dolphins are seven point favorites over under a 44. Mitchell Trubisky versus the return of Tua. Kenny Pickett in all likelihood going to miss this game with a concussion. Oh my gosh, this is going to be so bad. This game is going to be borderline unwatchable. The Steelers defense is very banged up. Give me the over in this game. I don't want to bet on the Dolphins. I don't want to bet on Tua six minutes removed from that, that head injury. At the slightest turn, he could be taken out of this game. And then we're back to a Dolphins team that's relying on its like six string quarterback. There is a strong possibility we could see Mr. Trubisky versus the Dolphins literally fourth string quarterback in this game. And that's not something I, I want to bet on at all. That being said, I think both teams move the ball pretty well against each other's defenses with the Steelers def- uh, injuries to the secondary and the, the Dolphins injuries to the secondary. Give me the over in this game, over 44 and a half. Drop a little bit on Deontay Johnson, anytime touchdown scorer. The guy's getting such intense target volume. At some point, the numbers have to come around. He has to get into the end zone. He's due for some positive touchdown regression. So give me Deontay Johnson, anytime touchdown scorer. Finally, this brings us to our last game, Monday Night Football, and a new segment which I'm calling the Sicko Game of the Week. So the Sicko Game of the Week is rather straightforward. It's a game that you have to be a legitimate football sicko to enjoy, to, to be sitting there watching, where halfway through you realize, what am I doing? How did I get here? You are a sick maniac who is going to sit through the Bears at the New England Patriots. 
An over-under of 39-and-a-half, Justin Fields versus Bailey Zappi. Yes, you are a sick maniac if you're sitting through this. And you know what? I will be there. I will be there with you, right there with you. This is the sicko game of the week. The Patriots are 7-and-a-half-point favorites. Another line in that teaser Vegas zone. Oh, I don't want to do it. I don't want to touch it. I don't want to touch it. I don't trust the Patriots. The Bears, for as much as they struggled last week, feel like a team that figured something out offensively. They had a lot of opportunities to win that game at the goal line. If the Bears' offense can figure out a way to let Justin fields loose i'm eager to see what he looks like because when he the guy has the ball in his hands he is an amazing runner an amazing runner in open space but too often they seem to be trying to fit a square peg in a round hole and turn him into some sort of pocket passer the patriots are coming off two big victories where i faded them every week i'm gonna fade them until i'm right i've been doing this for 20 years it hasn't worked out that well despite that i'm gonna take the bears here plus seven on the road at the Patriots. The Bears have to win at some point, right? They have to figure something out. Even if Darnell Mooney and Dante Pettis are your, your number one offensive weapons, at a certain point, things have to turn. And I'm betting on the Bears this week to go on the road and stick it to Bill Belichick and the Patriots. So let's briefly talk about some big picks for this week. I know I said I wasn't going to give you guys out a teaser. Just going through the slate, I could not help myself. I, I just couldn't. I couldn't help myself. But look at the slate. Look at a lot of these low over-unders. A lot of numbers that we typically see in the Vegas zone and think there, there's probably some value to be had here. I'm still looking at my wounds from the last couple teaser losses. So my first teaser is going to be the Raiders minus one at home. The over-under in this game, a low 45 and a half. Perfect within that little teaser zone. I know I said I want the Texans here on the seven, but the Raiders should win this game at home, especially off, off a bye. I know both teams are coming off a bye, but the Raiders need, need, need this game at this point if they want to remain in playoff contention. So tease them down to minus one. And then this is tough. This is tough. But I'm going to take the Cowboys minus one. Another low over under game. Uh, we can pair those two up. The Cowboys and the Raiders, both at home, both low over unders, both getting down to minus one. It just feels right. Both teams need this game if they want to remain in contention for their divisions, in contention for the playoffs. So I'm just relying on the fact that at a certain point, these teams, if they want to win, if they want to be there come February, come January, they need to cover and win some of these games. So if we can get that line down to one, I think there's value to be had. Finally, my big play of the week, I'm not giving out a parlay, bet on the Jaguars. The Jaguars are going to beat and win against the Giants this week. Jaguars, minus two and a half, minus three. I love it. I think this is the play that's really going to make people money this week. It feels to me like the Giants are getting so, so overhyped, and nobody's going to be eager to bet on a Jaguars team that has looked like dog shit half the time they've been on the field. So, with that said, give me the Jaguars, minus three. That's my big play of the week, even bigger than my teaser. Jaguars, Jaguars, Jaguars. Thanks, as always, for listening. I'll be back next week. Until then, I will talk to you guys soon. Bye now.